What are morals? Hi, I'm John. Welcome to Philosopher's Corner. Today we're going to talk about morals. One of the very fundamentals of philosophy. Morals are observations or rules regarding the determination as to whether or not human behavior is either good or bad. It's one of the fundamental inquiries into human behavior, human psyche, the human soul, and ultimately possibly pay dirt for why we're here. It's a conversation and philosophical topic that has been with man essentially as soon as we could really start communicating with each other. It's sort of that important. A, Determination of standards by which to hold human behavior relative to. And just to determine it, to try to figure out if it actually exists. If indeed, if something is determined to be good, is there a benefit to it? Or if something is determined to be bad, is it does it produce detriment? Right? So the rules of observations regarding human behavior is either good or bad. And where I like to start with this set of things, by the way, morals are what ethics are built on. Ethics are systems of beliefs, systems of moral beliefs. So once you have, once you determine what morals are, the good and the bad of particular behaviors, then the next level is that people attempt to put systems of those morals together and believe that those systems have particular outcomes and those are what ethics become so morals we're concerned with the determination of the behavior of a human is rather good you know good or bad so what i like to begin with this is i like to think of myself just in a blank reality a white room like in the matrix like a loading level of reality and in that room in that white light where it's just me and I observe myself, let's start there, right? Like, so what are, what are my behaviors? How would you label, if I do something in that environment with no stimuli or anything, if I did something to myself that made me better and produced a good vibe and it made me uh, healthier as a person, then I think we could say, okay, that's that's a good behavior, right? Like that's a moral thing to do in a real basic way. Just go, okay. And I could kind of look at any of my behaviors in that light and say, if it's just me in there, there's no interaction right now. Well, there is. The interaction is with myself. This is where the idea of self-awareness comes in. To treat myself as though I was treating another person. Because our first actions always emanate to ourselves. It's, self, it's always self-treatment first. Self-action is always affecting ourselves primarily. So in this scenario where I'm in there by myself, with myself, any action that I take in terms of morals, I can determine if it's increasing my health, if it's increasing my vitality, if it's growing me. And that's just on the physical, biological level. Are my actions contributing to my health in a way that's relative to what the potential of my body has in it? Am I properly stewarding myself in relation to the potential that I'm given in my human condition? And any action that can be construed as good is going to fit into that notion in this scenario where it's just me with myself. Conversely, any action I do, let's say I decided to start punching myself in the face, gouging my own eyes out, breaking my own bones, saying negative things to myself. Now we can clearly see that 
I'm using my self-awareness and force of will to do damage to myself. To take myself out of harmony with the trajectory of the potential that I have. And in fact, making the quality of my experience less, lessening my potential, damaging myself. And that's, I will put into the categorization of immoral. Now I'm engaged in bad behavior. The bad behavior is confined to my relationship with myself. And the more we can just really, really, really focus in to that idea at a granular level, in a vacuum with me, with myself, if I'm doing things that benefit myself in a healthy manner, remember, there's no... In this scenario, there's no power plays. There's no nothing. It's just, how am I treating myself? If I'm treating myself in a manner which increases my health and vitality and growth and potential, then that's moral. And if I'm doing things that affect my person and experience negatively and retard my growth and stupefy me and put me into areas of displeasure, I am acting immorally towards myself. And we can further take this into other areas of self-interaction. Things that I'm doing to expand my mind, things that I'm doing to expand my heart, things that I'm doing to increase my connection with reality. I can say those are moral things in this scenario. And the opposite would be true. Things that I'm doing to narrow my mind or shut off my reality or limit my access to growth in the reality could be considered immoral. Now in this scenario, as we go deeper and deeper into the analysis, it becomes obvious in short form that it's not necessarily the condition of the physical body or the mind or even the level of perception that we have that's like the chief concern in this scenario of what's being affected is cause and reality are real it's the only reason we care about the morals in the first place is because we intuitively understand that cause and effect occurs so that deep down we know that good behavior goes out and creates good scenarios and bad behavior creates bad effects so when we get down to this level and we go okay it's moral to do things that promote health and vitality and growth and immoral to do things to myself that do the opposite. But really, we know it's not just about the body or the mind or those things. We know that where it really affects is the soul. We know that. And that's really what we're trying to get down to with morals. What we're really saying, what we're really asking are what are, what are the rules for soul health? How can we determine behavior based on laws of the soul and health of the soul? And how can I discern actions in relation to soul health with something that's good for the soul being categorized as moral and something that's bad for the soul being categorized as immoral and all the spaces in between? You know, you could just be like in certainly be in morally neutral space. So now we're talking about the relationship with the self as it has a relationship with the soul and the effects of behavior on the soul as we try to determine soul health and rules for soul health individually. Now, when we take it out of that scenario with that understanding that our first relationships are with ourselves in morals, whether we're treating ourselves good or bad, because how can a person who doesn't understand these things hope to have any idea of what morals mean now that they're interacting with other people who also have this burden of morality on themselves built in, whether, whether or not they acknowledge it or not, doesn't, doesn't matter. It doesn't affect the fact that, like, Everybody is engaged in a moral exercise. It's just their level of awareness about it determines how much they can take control of their decision making. So now you take that person, and if a person 
has this understanding and they go out and they can discern for themselves morality. Okay, right? Because now, you know, we interact with each other, we affect each other. Now it's not just self on self, now it's individuals interacting with individuals. And I think, I analyze it, we still get to the same point. We get to the point where, and it is contextual, this is important to understand, discerning morals in interactions between people, it does require context for many of it. Most of the time, not. Most of the time, people are happily interacting. And the morality is, it's not even questioned. <laughs> and, you know, because when we're meeting up with different people and the morale, like, you know, the ideas of good and bad are coming together. Because, like I said, people have different ethics. So they've, they come into society with different sets of beliefs about the morals. Now, some of them are very, like, entrenched beliefs. And, you know, some are just wrong. Some are right, right on and some are totally wrong. And how do, we, how do we start determining that, like, each time? Well, okay, when people interact with each other, so is there absolute morality? Yes, there are some absolute moralities, but those moralities depend on context. But that's different from necessarily from it being relative. All morality, I think, is relative to the universal frequency. If you're on universal frequency, and you act in accordance with it, the morality becomes apparent. Now, contextually, in these situations that we get into, in which philosophy is chiefly concerned, we start to get into ideas of... How do you cal basically they want to know how do you calculate the morality? It's not just the determination of a particular behavior. Like okay, uh, obviously, like in the situation where I'm beating myself up, you go, oh, that's immoral. Like why are you doing that to yourself? Well, you walk in, I'm beating somebody up. You go, oh, well, that's obviously immoral. Well, not necessarily if you back up the tape ten seconds ago and you know that person just like murdered my family. You're like, oh, okay, right. So the context, <clears throat> the context in terms of trying to calculate things, it gets difficult really quickly. And we are in a temporal world, which means there's a time, there's, there's time occurring, which means context to determine morality in particular events depends on where you pick up the story. To me, that's where universal frequency it comes in, because then it will inevitably, it can show you where the relative context begins in terms of the determination you're trying to make in that particular moment. I mean, you can start with easy ones where people come together for to do good things, right? Oh, we need to go help. People are starving. The group's like, that's messed up. Let's make an organization and get food to these people. Other people show up. They're like, okay, let's do something good. Let's do something good. Okay, good. And then, like, food goes to people who need food. And then that's good. And it's like, good, 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 good. And you can feel and see and you can determine that those are good. In fact, a lot of the times, it's something... If something's really good, a lot like most of the time, if something's really good, you don't really have to deeply analyze it. You just, yeah, okay, it's like prima facie, like yeah, that's good. And it goes back into, so now you have like a group event of people engaging in moral exercise, and it also still fits the criteria of what I'm saying in the individual scenario where those individuals, they're achieving soul growth, vitality, health, and they're on the trajectory of putting their potential into action, into matter. And in those moments, you can feel that. That's the moment people, when people, when they do good and they have fulfilled lives and they're doing things that they know are in harmony with universal frequency and good, and it's clear there's a feeling that, that comes up in the people doing it, and they go, oh, well, that feels good. Yeah, because it, it feels good to do good. In terms of doing good is its own reward, that's one of the many things. That feeling of it coming in is the amelioration of the soul, the growth of the soul, the lessons coming in, the so many other causes and effects that are occurring that you're centered on you 
from engaging in moral activity. Conversely, when people get together uh, to do awful wars and genocides and the darkest stuff that humans can think of, the most immoral actions, which are obviously pitch black immoral things, where they get up and they decide they're going to go to work today to the, you know, kill a human's weapons factory and act like it's a real job and then, you know, get a whole bunch of other like-minded people together to fabricate uh, mass killings for whatever reason they give, doesn't really matter, usually for money and power and control, whatever justifies their bad behavior. And then they go out and then they go do their thing and they're engaged in obviously immoral activity. Those individuals in those groups, they're experiencing the exact opposite of what the people in the group doing moral activity experience. Like moral activity, people are experiencing what can be called like an enlightenment, essentially. And then the people in the other group that are doing all the immoral activity, consciously immoral activity, they're experiencing soul decimation. Now, oftentimes they, they're very confused because their ego is being fortified while their soul is being destroyed. And oftentimes people who philosophize who are on the side of engaged in a generally like immoral lifestyle, they're not really philosophizing, they're doing self-justification. And self-justification has its wellspring in the ego. And the ego will say, do, or tell the practitioner anything it can to stay alive. Especially when it's accumulated enough power to battle against the person. So if you put that person back in the one-room scenario, and you put them in there, they look like they would have basically a demon, you know, because they would be interacting with their own ego, and their ego would be arguing for its own power and its own empowerment in the immoral realm. And... You know that person might look schizophrenic or bipolar or whatever they would they would just look unhealthy right the moral people who were like promoting their health and vitality and growth in harmony with universal frequency and in conjunction with other people who are also attempting to you know be on that frequency are experiencing healthy growth benefits and then the immoral people they, they're shattering themselves and they're arguing, they're arguing for their bad behavior, and they're creating um, essentially like false morality. They're, they're, they're discerning the morality wrong, and they're giving really elegant reasons why to justify their own bad behavior. And then on top of it, they tend to build ethics on top of those like, system of beliefs based on these moral structures, which they think circularly justifies their bad behavior. But the proof is in the pudding. Like... It's, it's the health, the growth, and, and the enlightenment exponential of the practitioner, you know. And morality, the discernment of good or bad, is the fundamental skill to trigger one's self-awareness, self-responsibility, and ultimately self-actualization. Because then you know how to run, now you know how to, like, what energies you're taking in for processing and how your behaviors affect whether you're in, you know, good streams of energy or bad streams of energy. Ones that are either healthy for you or detrimental to you. And the more and the longer you stay in each one, the more you can know. Now, in a more general sense of enlightenment, you have to be able to integrate both. Because you know, very few of us are saints who are always <laughs> living in the light. So sometimes you do you make some bad decisions or you do something that's immoral, uh, and you gotta integrate that. So you got you this isn't like, oh, you know, cast everybody off, but when you build up more momentum and inertia in life and experience, you'll find that you, you get into a groove, like generally somewhere in the spectrum of light from like light to dark in terms of the moral things. And like, sometimes, you know, you, if you're generally like in the light in your inertia, yeah, every once in a while you might like curse or do something stupid and like, hey, and like go back and, but you're generally in there. And, and if you're generally like waking up and like figuring out how to kill people every day, you're, you know, pretty much like in the dark and moral side of things. And like every once in a while, like you kid yourself and do something nice to like, you know, I did something nice three months ago. I'm going to go back to like making my blood money. You know, generally like you're in a bad spot, right? Those are just general. Like, and when you're born, you can't like, eh, you know, you're trying to like build up that momentum. But it's all 
fundamentally based on the ability to discern some types of good and bad. And you, and you can you can parse that into psychology and spirituality and all these other things, because really what we're talking about is one of the most basic connection points to the reality and the energy in the reality. It goes beyond like the human ability to vocalize these things and say, oh, well, before we get into more sophisticated consequences of morality, it's really easy to just go, oh, well, you know, we're just like, you know, look at behavior and da-da-da. It's like all superficial. But like, no, this is deep philosophy. Deep philosophy is about how are we intellectually, mind, body, and soul aligning ourselves to be connected to the deepest level of the reality. And that's because we're human beings. And we have the gift and the capability, and I dare say the responsibility, to connect to that level of the reality. Because that's where the energies reside. That's where true creation resides. And that is where, as much as we have to learn to be stewards of ourselves for good energy and for good ethics, that prepares us to rise up and take worldly responsibilities. And to gain worldly responsibilities, we do need to be connected at the deepest levels of the reality, which are essentially purely en their energy and vibration, you know, energy and frequency. We simply are. That's, that is science. And that is also what philosophers agree on, and sages and messiahs and everybody. It's energy and frequency before it gets to this light show that we're in. And so in doing that, the discernment between the good and the bad is about how to get to the energies, right? Now let's say immorality, it's always like, it sounds like a caste system, but it's not. Because once you know this, if you're like, if you are somebody stuck in the depths, you can, you can climb up the frequencies. Yeah, that's the thing. You can just decide to be like better. You can decide like, okay, I'm evil. Today I'll just be like bad. You didn't kill the person, you just kicked him in the face, okay? Tomorrow you didn't kick the person in the face, you, just, you, you punched him in the gut. Next day you didn't punch him in the gut, you just gave him a talking to. Next thing you know, like, you know, you're, half, you're halfway to like being like in purgatory. <laughs> you're halfway to being a decent person. If, conversely, if you're a good person, you keep getting better, the sky's the limit. I mean, Gandhi's a real person, and Martin Luther King Jr. is a real person, and like, Jesus Christ was a real person. Like, it's like all these like, you know, good persons there's like a whole bunch of good persons and the reason they got there is they just kept being good and they didn't like let people confuse them about argues of moral relativism and this and that like look contextually people want people always want to know is there justification for self-defense to the level of murder yeah there is now on the non-philosophical side when i get into the akashic records of those cases of people having to do that Inevitably, the people entangled in a justifiable murder scenario have past life karma that's resolving in the present moment. Okay? So, for all you fancy deep philosophers who think you're so fancy and deep, if we really want to get into moral relativism, you have to acknowledge the truth of reincarnation. And you have to acknowledge the truth of infinite connection of your karmic stream. And you have to acknowledge the truth of the Akashic Records. Which are basically just like soul charts. If it was a, it's like a doctor's office with soul charts. You can go in, you get a library pass, you request like Akashic Records, they'll basically give you a little chart, little, and it basically just like sine and cosine waves. It's all vibe and frequency, and it goes back to whatever point that person's soul is incepted. And you can learn to read it however you want to read it. And, you know, some people in this density, they are locked in a in an intertwining one life they're the oppressor and the other life they're the oppressed and the person they're dancing with switches places with them weird stuff right so in terms of moral relativism if you want you can use it but you can't use it to justify your power grabs and bad behaviors it's more moral contextualism and the context is that we're on the infinite timeline we're eternal beings so i want to try to like cherry pick like which timeline that you're going to apply the context to and where you begin the story right because generally speaking if people are engaged in behavior it's because they both need the behavior even if the person like is really being put upon it may it's you gotta look real deep into it that could be there the moment that the universe is like hey you're gonna stand up for yourself right, i went to 
public school. I was flip flop between public and private school, but I went to a lot of public school in LA, and I was always getting picked on. I was smaller. Uh, I was being desegregationally bused into <laughs> like areas that had a lot of gangs in the '80s and '90s, and I was every year in junior high, I get assigned to bully, and every year I'd have to stand up to him. And whenever I did, it ended it, even though they were way bigger than me and way more psycho. And each of those cases, it was, it was, they were lessons I needed to learn that I attracted from the bully. You know, it was a whole dance. So in terms of the morality, like when you, if you show up to me standing up to the bully, you go, oh, what's, what's this guy doing? Why is he like being mean to this other human? Okay. You back it up, you go, oh, well, that guy was bullying him. Oh, well, then that's, that's moral. Then you back it up and find out that kid's like getting beat to crap at home and go, oh, well, that's understandable. Right, and then you see the dad, and you go, "Well, why did the dad do that?" And you go, "Oh, well, he got beat up at home as a kid." And you go, "Oh, that's understandable." And you go, "Oh, why did his dad do it?" And, oh, well, he got beat up at home. Well, that's understandable. Why did he get beat? Up? Oh, well, he was like in a village that got taken over by European imperialists in central Mexico. And you're like, "Oh, well, that's understandable." And you go, "Why did before that? And before that? Before I was like, okay." But here's the thing: when you do that, you realize I'm telling you the truth about this eternal karmic timeline where the morality helps shape that vibe that transcends time and space and goes through all humans and that's truly the collective consciousness and the collective consciousness is what morality contributes to arguably all of the soul energy on the planet is a direct reflection of it's a distillation of all of our moral choices moment by moment that guides the consciousness and the reality of the world we live in right so yeah, discern for yourself good or bad, and when you can, when you start doing that and you get a handle on it, because once you do it, the examples don't matter, right? Philosophy is about informing an individual. And an individual starts to make these choices and gets engaged and becomes aware and starts to see the truth for themselves, and then you can be the guy on the bench, you know, talking at length about how you feel about it all, and now she figured it out and like went out and did stuff, right? And you'll know. Society can give you metrics or whatever, but. At the, end of, at the end of the night, I think the greatest thing for morals, given a healthy person, a generally healthy person, like you haven't murdered anybody, you don't, you know, you don't have felonies, like, you know, you're not violent all the time, like, people don't tell you that, like, you know, if you're a healthy person, you're centered, people are like, oh, that's, you're a good person, you know, like, which is most of us, to be honest. Um, when you go to bed at night, your conscience <laughs> will absolutely inform you of the general level of your morality. It absolutely will. It's like maybe its chief function in your life is this little bad boy here, right, in the prefrontal, which really starts getting developed around 25, which is a different discussion. But once this bad boy correlates all the information, including all your soul information, because your soul is getting a clean look, 100% clean look at all your actions during the day. When you go to bed at night and it comes in and it starts forming your conscience of like what you did and permutations and timeless, you know, backwards and forwards and all directions, calculations that we can't really do with our normal brain. That's why we have, you know, a higher self up there working for us. It'll inform our conscience and our dream state as well. And then it'll let us know, you know. Uh, and for a generally healthy person, it's like, if you did bad stuff, you can't sleep that night. It bothers you. It nags at you. Why? Because your little Jiminy Cricket that's on your shoulder is telling you, dude, you got to do some introspection about these things. Because one of the good things about morals is that if you do do something bad, it may be just in your unconscious. And, it, and the bad feeling and the thing that's not unlocking open in your life because of uh, bad morals can be brought to your attention so that you can work on it and evolve. Right? So doing immoral things, like newsflash, spoiler Life is all a learning lessons, so no matter how long you're in it, good and bad are going to both eventually work to make you evolve and purify you and make you better. It doesn't matter. It's, like, it's an infinite timeline. So eventually, if you do enough bad stuff, like you just find yourself in a room doing bad stuff, and you, it, like, it doesn't matter. It could take like 10 million years. You just sit in a room going, oh, man, I got to stop doing bad stuff. Like It happened to everybody. Plus, once you realize how good it feels to do good things and be moral and ethical, and you realize the benefits of feeling that you get from doing good, you'll never do other stuff anyway because it's just like you wouldn't want it. It's a waste of time. You're just like, that's ridiculous. self apparent But, so, in terms of 
the function of morals in the human condition is the chief catalyst. It's, it's where the rubber meets the road. You can do something good, you can do something bad. You can do something that grows you, makes you feel good, or you do something that like gets in your own way and in the ways of other people. Yeah, other people, they want to like, you know, blow the sip into ways to justify governments or, or huge macro systems of control and behavior. And behavior can be inspired and bad behavior can be deterred uh, to a degree. But generally speaking, you know, you can't, you can't control or legislate actual behavior. The values never line up. The enforcement is probabilistic. And the power that it sends is the wrong kind of power to the wrong kind of people. It's personal responsibility. And it's one no one can escape. Because it's possibly the chief, most primal, energetic soul function of a human being. Is to figure out a way to determine between good and bad. And then eventually, by interacting and living life with enough other people... You find out whether you're making the right choices or not. If they're good, or if you if you have determined, you know, good from bad behavior and energy replication, energy and frequency effects, and it'll come back to you. And you know, the more you the, the more you accept it, the faster it goes, and the better you can get. And the more you deny it, you know, I don't recommend that. <laughs> so morals. The ability to discern good from bad. There's a million ways to do it. In the end, everybody's got to do it. You have no choice. If you're not making the choice, you are making the choice. And once you get healthy, the good vibe will tell you everything you need to know about choices. Well, I hope this is helpful. Thanks for joining me here at Philosopher's Corner. Uh, always a pleasure. Have a great day wherever you are.